All right, we're back for the last session. Uh, it's been a long day. We've had a lot of people present. We've had some really good sessions. My favorite session, other than the customer awards that we just did, I am delighted to introduce uh, Jeff Ma, who is currently working at Microsoft around uh, growth and startup organizations, uh, which we'll talk to him about in a second. But Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, welcome. So I have some questions. We're just going to go through. I know uh, I've seen some of your um, some of your talks online. I know we're going to get to some good stories. Um, but what I wanted to do was start with some icebreakers, just so uh, some people can get to know you. I know we haven't shared these, so we'll definitely get your honest answer, okay? <laughs> okay. All right. Very easy. Beer or wine? Wine. Batman or Superman? Batman. Okay. Ski or surf? I feel like you're judging me with every answer, so... <laughs> I can't judge you, Jeff. It's, uh, it's, all, it's okay. Ski or surf? Uh, surf. Surf. The last book you read? Uh, this Naked Mind. Okay. What was that about? It's about, it's a very light subject about uh, addiction and alcohol uh, addiction. Kind of like the bias of how we kind of condition ourselves to drink and like like drinking it's a very interesting concept right because uh -huh. i like that I, I mean i i'm very aware that one of the reasons i like to drink wine is the sort of ceremony around drinking wine it's not just yeah. the taste of it um yeah. but it's a, it's all about like how we kind of train our minds in a bad way to, to to like love things that aren't good for us i guess yeah well i like that i might check that out uh the first concert you attended so I, I think it was uh, Ziggy Marley and the B-52s back in the nice. day. Nice. Very eclectic. <laughs> That's one Very word eclectic. for it. Yeah. Uh, favorite word? Uh, irregardless. Irregardless. That's a good one. The crew here like that one. Most overused word in business? Oh, how about in life? Literally. Uh, in business... I don't know, like these days working at Microsoft, people say motion all the time, like, like sales motion, motion. Yeah, yeah. Alignment is my, is my, I think is the most overused word in business. I hear it all the time. Um, uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? There was a time that I wanted to be a singing teacher and a golf teacher because like there was a, there's a guy on Mr. Rogers that was a singing teacher and a golf teacher. So I think that that was what I wanted to be. For a long time in college, I thought I wanted to be a, a doctor, like a sports medicine doctor. Um, yeah, I have nice. no idea. I have no idea what I even am right now. That's the thing. Like, I have, like, <laughs> yeah, we'll get onto that in a second. His career, so I still could be something. I think. Yeah. Last, uh, last icebreaker. The best piece of advice you were given in your life. The best piece of advice that I was ever given in my life. Um, God, that's a really hard question. Like, I know some like funny ones that are probably somewhat inappropriate for this, for this crowd <laughs> that, that yeah. I would say, I mean, I, so one of the, I'll tell you the best, uh, analogy that I've ever heard. And this is from my personal mentor, which is a guy by the name of Kevin Compton. He was the operating partner at Kleiner Perkins during the heyday now runs a fund called radar partners and is an incredible enterprise investor. He told me this story once. He said, so when you're little, you can eat all the ice cream you want because you won't get fat, but you can't drive there and you have no money to go get it. And then you get older and you're a teenager and now you can go drive to get all the ice cream you want and you can still eat all the ice cream you want. You don't get fat, but you don't have any money to buy all the ice cream you want. And then when you get older, you now have all the money to buy the ice cream you want and you can drive to go get all the ice cream you want. But you can't eat all the ice cream you want anymore because you'll get fat. Yeah. So it's a great analogy of life. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Okay. That's got to know you a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I want to come on to, obviously, um, we'll start with your, um, your study with MIT and, and some background there. So um, take us back to your time there. Um, how did that whole thing start? You're at MIT. You just, did you have a thing for, for gambling? Uh, did you just like, where did that idea and interest come from? And can you just uh, give the audience like kind of a synopsis as how that 
how that developed? Yeah, I mean, really the, the MIT thing was that this MIT Blackjack team had been around for quite some time. And originally, um, there were friends of friends of friends of mine that were doing it. Like I kind of would hear a little bit about it. Um, and then eventually became friends of friends and eventually became, became my roommates. And they were like leaving every weekend to go to Vegas. And I was like, where are you guys going? And they're like, we're going to Vegas. And I was like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, well, we're gambling. And I was like, well, can I come? And so it ultimately first started as like this kind of like thing where I just had major FOMO and wanted to go hang out with my roommates in Vegas. And when we got out there, um, I saw how much money you can make. And I was like very attracted by the challenge of trying to beat the house. And, you know, when I was in high school, I played poker, enjoyed it. I mean, I had some penchant for numbers, I guess, but really it was about, um, you know, wanting to be around my friends and sort of the camaraderie that really got me involved in blackjack. That's why there's so many analogies to what we did in blackjack in the startup world, which is where I'm, you know, grew up. It's the the idea of like a few of you really trying to go after a common goal together and, you know, trying to be the sum of your parts being a lot bigger than the actual parts. Um, so I, I mean, that, that was really what got into me. Like it wasn't some deep, you know, seated analytical, pension or love it was more of a of a desire to like hang out with my friends and try to beat the casinos right so you started that way you started hanging out with your friends was there a moment where as you were i mean did you start losing or you were winning you thought i could double down did you start losing anything i i there's there's something here that i can figure out what was was there a Oh, I think I think I can improve this. What what, what was that moment? Yeah, that I mean, you, so the, the system itself has been in place for quite some time. Like the concept of card counting was developed by a guy by the name of Ed Thorpe, who was a UCLA professor and then an MIT professor, and he kind of like discovered card counting in the late nineteen six or the mid nineteen sixties, using like an IBM main, mainframe computer to do all the simulations. Um, what we did did and what we got better at was the concept of using like a team to play where we would go in. And you'll, again, you'll see this theme of teamwork and camaraderie being the thing that uh, really fueled me throughout it. But we had a way to do this as a team um, where we were able to make it much more efficient. You know, I had a seminal moment in my life where that really dictated a lot of, of what, what I am, where I essentially lost two hands of blackjack over the course of, you know, five minutes. And I lost 50,000 on each hand. So I lost a hundred thousand dollars and and sort of like had that moment in time where I kind of doubted myself and wondered honestly, like, where, where am I going with this? And like, what am I doing? And it was one of the things that gave me probably the most conviction in numbers and analytics and ultimately gave me the, the fortitude that it later take took to start four companies. Yeah. I think I, uh, I saw one of your videos that said you were, you're up in your room questioning yourself and you're like, no, no, I'm going to go back downstairs. I'm going to figure it out. And you ended up uh, uh, winning uh, at the end of the weekend. Is that correct? Yeah. So I lost uh, $100,000 on two hands. And it's like this classic moment where I like collapsed on the floor and stared up at the ceiling. And I was like wondering to myself, why is there a mirror up there? But like, you know, as an MIT student, I have no idea why they put mirrors up on the ceiling. And uh, ultimately, <laughs> I got to a point where I... Um, got myself through a lot of the the sort of biases that would have kept me from going back down to play like a loss aversion with just this classic bias where we were afraid of losing you know and like if i didn't go back down and play i wouldn't have lost but you keep afraid to lose process versus outcome like had the losses derived were they were the result of of a bad process or a bad uh you know outcome and and really it was outcome not process and Ultimately, also, I thought about like my own career playing blackjack and I had won quite a bit more than I had lost. It was just this one hand or two hands that really were kind of making me doubt myself. And I couldn't doubt myself. Ultimately, I had to sort of keep pushing through. Um, so that was a very, like I said, seminal moment for me. Yeah. Was there a point because I, I think you talk about this, too. It's not that it's illegal that obviously the casinos don't like you doing it. Did it yeah. like were you nervous? Were you thinking you're going to get thrown out? They were going to spot you? Like, how, how how did that feel? Yeah, there was always like a cat and mouse game with the casinos, honestly, where they were always trying to intimidate you. Um, it wasn't illegal. It's just using your brain to beat a game. And it seems pretty un-American for them to not allow you 
to play. Um, they look at it as entertainment and they don't want people that are in there going to, that are going to beat them. And like, in some ways yeah. you can't blame them because they're a business. Um, but yeah, no, I shied away from anything illegal. Um, I did enjoy the sport of it. Um, I definitely did not enjoy the feeling that like people were going to like kick me out. And they, they literally, there were stories of them coming into your room in the middle of the night and kicking you out in the middle of the night when they realized or figured out that you were a card counter. That never happened to you? It never happened to me. I think it happened to me in my dreams where I would like be sitting there <laughs> like asleep, like trying to, you know, get ready for the next day and worrying about every noise I heard at the front door. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're doing this with your crew at MIT and then tell me a little bit how, about how the movie came about. Like how did that whole experience, how did it start? Like where did that kick yeah, off? Yeah. So, um, a friend of mine by the name of Ben Mezrick had written six books at the time. Um, fair to say that his career was not necessarily going anywhere though. Cause he had just kind of written a book that got turned into like a made for TV movie um, starring like Robert Wagner and Antonio Sabato jr. And like the, this is probably in like the early two thousands or late nineties. And um, yeah, he'd written, a bunch of things, but I kind of approached him. I said, Hey, I've got a great idea for your next book. And he says, well, what is it? And I said, well, me and my buddies, we go to MIT and we use math to be the casinos. And he was like, you know what? I don't think anyone wants to read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. <laughs> and then I took him with me to Vegas and he said, Oh my God, this is the coolest thing. We should write a book about this. And I said, great idea, Ben. And then we, we approached his publisher and his publisher actually said the exact same thing. I don't think anyone wants to read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. And we didn't listen to where we wrote, bring it down the house. It got turned into a, uh, it was a New York Times bestseller for over a year. And eventually um, was turned into a movie that uh, made, was number one in the box office two weeks in a row. Um, and eventually became, um, you know, a, 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 it made like $150 million off a $35 million budget. So I always say in the end, people did want to see a movie and read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds which was cool because the nerds actually won in this instance. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, I, I've heard you talk about this before, but just in case the audience don't know, how close is the movie to the real life, uh, the things that were happening? Obviously, I know movies take some kind of uh, dramatic effect. Yeah. Well, one of my buddies was over last night or on Monday night. And he, someone asked us the same question and he was actually in the, um, he was part of the team. And he said the, the movie, the book was loosely based on the story. And then the movie was loosely based on the book. So if you think about a couple levels of abstraction and what happens there, um, much of what they did in the movie was indeed true. But the movie itself, like the plot of it and my character in it. And I, I always have this joke where we were going to see the premiere of the movie in Las Vegas. And I brought my parents out there and we were walking to the movie. I said, told my dad, I said, dad, I have a, a couple pieces of bad news. I, he said, well, what are they? And I said, well, in the movie, I'm white and you're dead. So that's bad news. <laughs> yeah, but that was a shock. Uh, two shocks for him all at once. Yeah, I don't know which. I, I like to think like I have some bad news and some really bad news. And I'm not sure which was the really bad news. But I guess probably <laughs> the him being the dead was probably the worst news, right? Yeah, yeah, probably. Did you, um, uh, last question on the movie. Did you spend time on site? Were you part of the advising team? Yeah, it was super was fun. Um I spent a bunch of time on the set there. Actually, like a pretty funny story is like one of the days that I was out there filming and I, and I, uh, I actually played a dealer in the movie um, named right. Jeffrey. And the, the person that plays me, Jim Sturgis, walks up to me and says, Jeffrey, my brother from another mother. And we have like a witty back and forth. If yeah. you want to go back and watch it, it's at about 59 minutes and three seconds. About um about 59, about yeah just, about just so 59 minutes and okay three seconds. everyone's like, got roughly that. roughly I, not roughly. that i know but roughly no no clearly uh one of the days we were filming out there the cast came up to me after filming and they said hey we'd love to take you out to dinner tonight and so we're walking over to uh the palms casino and uh th this is like kate bosworth and lawrence fishburne and some amazing actors and Kate pulls me aside and keep in mind, I'm like 30 and single at the time. She says, Hey Jeff, I've got a great idea for what you and I can do after dinner. And I was like, huh? Okay. What is it, uh -huh. Kate? And she said, uh, <laughs> I think we are really fun. If we all went to play blackjack together, you can teach us how to play and we can win a lot of money. And I said, Kate, first of all, that's not what I was hoping for. Second of all, that's a terrible <laughs> idea. And she said, why? And I said, uh, well, you know, 
They know me really well there. They won't let me play blackjack. And she said, it's okay. You'll be with me. I'm a big star. And I always said, um, Kate, it's been a long time since Blue Crush. I don't want a big star you are anymore. But after, you know, seven or eight bottles of wine, it seemed like this great idea. And uh, we show at the, up at the Palms Casino after dinner and sit down at the table. And the floor person says, Jeff, what are you doing? And I said, I'm here to play blackjack with Kate Bosworth, big star, Blue Crush, no big deal, right? And he says, well, uh, let me check. And he comes back to the table and he says, not only are you not allowed to play blackjack, but if your little friend Kate's at the table, you're not allowed to be within 20 feet of the table. What was cool was that gave me a lot of street cred with Kate. She thought I was very I dangerous bet. at that point. So yeah. yeah. She didn't get me anywhere with her in the long run, but at least she thought I was dangerous. No, for a minute there, you're a bad boy. That's that's <laughs> completely fine. Okay, so moving on a little bit. So obviously, literally, you know, like you no know, one's you... ever described me as a bad boy. So that's good yeah. to finally get that mark. <clears throat> Okay, so moving on a little bit, you know, you're obviously um, heavily into into data and the things you're doing with the startup. So I'm, we're just going to move on a little bit from that. So I'll start with an easy one. When you hear the term and when you talk to organizations, you hear the term data driven. What do you interpret by that? And what do most people that you talk to really yeah. think about data driven? It's a good question. Dale, you're good at this. This is a good question. So data-driven as a term, I think is somewhat too polarizing and also like too like too over overreaching in terms of its its because data-driven would imply that every decision you make is driven by data, right? And ultimately right. that's impossible, right? And there are going to be times when data is like not necessarily incorrect, but irrelevant for a situation. So I actually like to use the term data informed a bit more, which is like, how do you use data to inform decisions and not like data driven almost seems like too cliche to me. Um, uh -huh. But what I think ultimately it means is that you strive to use data to drive all the decisions that you make. And I think ultimately it's it's really hard to be truly data driven unless you empower the right people in your organization to have um, a seat at the table, right? And ultimately, like I think it's like going to be interesting to see what happens over the next, you know, um, ten to fifteen years with the data position at the C suite, whether it's there and whether they're able to really drive um, value there. Yeah, yeah, and we talk a lot. You know, we talked a lot today about. A lot of the <clears throat> lines of businesses are trying to get access to data and obviously IT have a lot of data. So I, I, I like what you said, which is like, where is that data? How do you make sure everyone has access to it? One of the things that I also, uh, uh, you said in one of your videos is about um, outcome bias. And you use the example of outcome bias of where you're at the table and you should make a decision, but you kind of feel pressure. Yeah. And I've, and I feel like a lot of organizations as well, they feel pressure to kind of like, okay, we've got to do all this. We've got to start gathering all this data. Like, I, I, basically, yeah, so there, there's two things. There's, there's, there's outcome bias, which is like actually being too impacted by what the ultimate outcome of an event mm -hmm. was versus the actual decision, right? The decision and the outcome are separate. Like if you think about like, uh, you know, we could go to a blackjack a casino tonight and you should say to me, hey, Jeff, I have 15 and the dealer has a nine. What do I do? If I tell you that you should hit, which is by far the right decision and you get a six to make 21, you're going to turn around and high five me. If you get a seven to make 22, you're going to like turn, spill your drink on me and ask me why they ever made a movie or a book about me. But in both yeah. cases, that decision was 100 percent correct. One, you just got unlucky and the other one, you know, so, so being too influenced by outcomes and even business outcomes, I think is you see it in sports all the time too, right? On fourth down in the NFL, if teams go for it, this is like the football oblong one versus the round football thing that maybe yes, your, I'm, I'm, your people are more so, familiar with. So, yes, I don't know why you call it football, but I get it. Yeah, no. So like, if you go for it on fourth down, um, the judgment of that decision is oftentimes based on the outcome versus the actual process. Right. right. And so that that is a big you know, that's a big thing. Right. Um, but the the thing that you're alluding to, I think, is more of what we call omission bias, um, where where we are literally like favoring inactivity over activity when it may lead to to harm. Right. I'd rather kind of sit back and passively 
allow the world to like collide on me than actively making a decision that could lead to harm. And, I, and the story I tell a lot about this is when my mom suffered a stroke, um, we had like a really interesting decision of whether to be, um, whether to actually intervene, like whether to use surgery to sort of get the blood clot out or not. And we were kind of advised not to, even though like it seemed clear that the surgeon was saying like there was a better potential outcome if we did intervene, but they didn't want to sort of like drive that decision and actively make a mistake. They'd rather almost like passively do that. And so ultimately we decided to operate and my mom had a good outcome at the time, which was a, which was a, a really important moment in our lives. And she ended up passing away relatively recent, well, a few years ago, but she lived 10 years after that first stroke. And we had like a great gift of 10 years with her by sort of not necessarily falling for this concept of favoring an activity over activity. Yeah, no, it's a, uh... So obviously that's a very personal story. So you've, you've moved on to, to Microsoft now, um, and we'll talk uh, some of the things that you're doing. Give me, uh, to, to kick off, what do you think people's biggest misconception is about Microsoft as a company? Wow. Um, I'll tell you what mine was. Mine was that it was a very unpersonal, you know, like soft, like, you know, kind of enterprise software, Windows, all that, like it is a very purpose-driven, inclusive, um, incredibly, uh, it's a very uplifting place to work. And it's a place where like me as a Silicon Valley person that had only judged it from afar, it's it's a wonderful place to work. And, and the work environment and the level of inclusivity and the level of um, diversity that uh, that we strive for and that we live and embody is, is very powerful. That's great, that's great. Um... So you're advising other startups now as part of your, your role at my, uh, Microsoft. How are these startups thinking about leveraging data? About, you know, is it, are they thinking about the people, the science, the tools? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the startups and data <coughs> question is a fascinating one because like the intersection of my life or the Venn diagram of my life is, you know, startups and data. The reality is that startups in their infancy, especially have very little data to make decisions, right? Like a lot of early decisions that you're even making in an, you know, in an app or a website or anything like that, they're based on like AB experimentation and things like that. And you try very hard to get data to make those decisions, but you're not talking about having a lot of data. That's a, and, and so that's a big issue. I think what you need to be doing as a startup is thinking about success and thinking about building the instrumentation that you need to down the road use data because how many times do we see get in a situation where startups haven't planned for that and they get to a point where they're like god i wish we had you know been logging this event or i wish right. we had been tracking you know this event and ultimately they kind of like lead themselves into a place where they don't have the data to do it so I, I think like anything in the world you really need to think about investing in the infrastructure and the machinery and instrumentation to collect the right data that you need and, and, and hope that one day you're going to be big enough where you have enough data to really make truly data-driven decisions. Yeah. Uh, a couple of companies, I've <clears throat> this company and the last company I worked on, we used to always say that, you know, if you haven't started collecting certain types of data across the business, you're kind of already behind because other people, the more data you have, the more um, analytics you can run, the more insights you get. So you're already, you know, you're For already sure. trying to catch up. For sure. <clears throat> so for these organizations specifically, and I think you, t you, you talk about this around, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, not COVID, I promise. All the crew just put their masks on. Um, but you talk about a data moat in right. some of your work. How do you, so moving on from that advising yeah. uh, staff, well, I mean, so I think, how do you so do that? I think there is, you know, I, I think what you're alluding to is there's sort of like three levels to how I think about success in analytics, right? And I learned this a lot from my time at Twitter, where I was trying to operationalize an organization to become more data driven and, and whatnot. And at the bottom level, the most fundamental level layer of this sort of equation is, is data. And the greatest way to create a competitive advantage with data is to have data that no one else has, right? And to have a data moat. And if you think about what are true data moats in the world, like there's not a lot, unfortunately, anymore because data has become so open and democratized and shared and whatnot um, and open sourced and 
but the idea of collecting data or finding data that no one else has. And like I, I do a lot in the world of sports betting, right? And there is um, there are sports bettors that have been quite successful by creating data sets that no one else has, by actually watching film and creating data out of that film that no one else has. And so the idea of of one, you know, and, and, and you have to have a level of patience with this because even in that, like, you know, there's there was a football coach who wanted to have better data than anyone else on offensive linemen. So he literally like went and hired, you know, these, these uh, um, football coaches, high school football coaches to watch film on offensive linemen and log sort of what they did to create new data on offensive linemen so that he had data that no one else had. So there's lots of ways to think about doing this, you know, in the world of, you know, the big tech companies that we know of, you know, the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world, they, the Googles, they do have data that no one else has. And that's what makes them successful. The reason that Facebook's ad products are so successful is because they just do have this data mode about us and our behavior and what we like and what we view and whatnot. And, you know, that's, that's what makes them successful. Also makes it somewhat dangerous sometimes. Um, but yeah. I mean, I, I think the data, you know, the data integrity or data um, ethics issue is a very interesting one. And I, I think about this a lot because I think about the idea of, you know, how do you know that um, you're using data in an appropriate way? And ultimately I think it's it's whether you're driving value for that customer or that end user that's giving you that data. Right. And I, I think about this a lot with my wife. So my wife does not like getting tracked on the internet, deletes cookies, does not, um, you know, uses incognito browsers, but literally will tell me, oh, this is like the third thing I bought today on Instagram. They just know me so well. And she's <laughs> happy about it because they're driving value for her by showing yeah. her good ads that, you know, are things that she wants to buy. So she doesn't care at that point. Yeah. Um, uh, I know uh, you talk about some of the interesting use cases or other types of organizations that are now <clears throat> using the data. So not just the big tech companies, you talk about restaurants and other people that are using data. Like, are you seeing any um, uh, uh, emerging uh, industries or verticals that are starting to, to kind of jump on this, this data train? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sports was like a very interesting one. Measuring human performance generally is one that I think is interesting that's not being done particularly well. I, I had a I was on Dave Chang, the the Momofuku, and he's sort of a real celebrity chef now. I was on his podcast. And one of the reasons he wanted me have have me on was he really felt like there could be data about like chefs and cooking and things like that. And and I um have recently talked to a guy that's that's wants to start a company around dynamic pricing in the restaurant business and trying to help restaurants embrace data more. I think any area where data has traditionally been hard to get to and now with uh, whatever they're doing, moving into the cloud or, or their systems moving into the cloud and their data being available through APIs, I, I think that's an area where you could see innovation with data. I think areas where computer vision and, and those types of technologies can allow for creation of new data. The actual analysis of data like is a commodity it's really around the collection of data where I think that there's going to be some really interesting um, innovation. Yeah. And we talk, you know, we talk, obviously we talked to a lot of organizations, we talked about data driven and there's this concept of obviously larger organizations have data silos. So do you advise companies around getting started with this kind of stuff? How yeah, do you I avoid mean, data silos? Data silos is tough because a lot of them are created by long term like technical debt that created that or with like yeah. governance or compliance. Like I've talked to people in the financial in like the financial industry that are like, I just can't even use this data, even though we have it like I can't market with it and whatnot. Um, again, I, I think ultimately we're going to get to a world with GDPR where if we're probably going to hopefully be able to become more aggressive with how we use data as long as we're very upfront about that use and allow people to opt out if they don't want to be part of it, right? Hopefully that's the ultimate result of GDPR. Um, but I do think it's it's challenging to think about data silos and like how we get around that. Like there was a, there was a guy that was proposing this big sort of data effort at Microsoft and he got to a point where he looked at me and he's like, well, what do you think? And I'm like, it's great, but how are you going to get all the people to agree to do this and share all this data? 
Right, right. Okay, well, uh, sadly, we're, <laughs> we've got about 30 seconds left. So I just wanted to finish with the last question. What is the one innovation that you hope to see uh, over the next three to five years or even in your lifetime that you, you just feels like so far away from where we are today? What is the one big innovation uh, like around things? Some form of like teleportation or like incredibly fast travel kind of thing. Like, you know, like yeah. even just like, the Elon Musk, like the whole like, like loop. yeah, th those types of like really fast travel. Um, you know, travel is still like ridiculously kind of inconvenient at the end of the world, right. at the end of the day, right? Like the idea that you know, even like I live up in Tiburon, you're down in you're down in San Mateo, but it would have literally taken me this afternoon, like it would have been like three hours out of my day, even though it's like what forty miles, if you fifty miles, if even that, right? Exactly. Exactly. We still have to fix some of those things, especially in the Bay Area, for sure. Yep. Well, Jeff, I appreciate your time. Uh, it's great to talk to you. And uh, thanks for being part of this show. And I hope we get to meet face to face, maybe not a three hour drive, but at some point in the future. Thanks for having me. Thanks, mate. Bye. All right. And I believe that that is a wrap. That's a wrap for the day. But this is actually only day one. It's a two-day show. Tomorrow, or actually in about eight and a half, nine hours' time, the EMEA event will be kicking off. So we're going to do all this again with different customers for our EMEA team. Uh, if you're crazy enough uh, to get up at 12.30 or 1 a.m. Pacific time with me, I will definitely be there, hopefully awake. Um, but I'll close this session this uh, uh, session for our America's teams uh, and customers and partners by saying thank you. Thank you for attending. Uh, thank you to all the customers. Thank you to all the partners. Thank you to all my team, the SnapLogic team, the crew here. It's been a great day. Uh, all these sessions will be available on demand uh, in the coming days. And hopefully this time next year, around this time next year, we'll get to meet face to face and I'll buy you all a drink. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day.